All right, I'll, enjoy, I'll invite you to find your seats and join us in our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Father, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you bestow on us, Lord. Um, Father, as we come upon our annual meeting today, Lord, uh, I'm just so thankful for everything that you do for this church, for the, the people of this church, Lord, and the leadership of this church, and the building, and how you hold it together, Lord. It is your church. And so I pray, Lord, during the meeting that we would do your will. And Father, I also just want to uh, say how blessed and thankful the past week has been for us as we uh, got to say goodbye to two of our saints um, yesterday and, and Friday, Lord, Mr. Nelson and, and uh, Ms. Jackie. And so just how thankful we are, Lord, that they were with us for so many years and uh, that we got such guidance and leadership and, and two great saints, Lord. And, and I'm also so thankful um, for our pastor, for Pastor Brad, that uh, he was there to give the gospel, Lord, and, and to give your word at those services. Just so blessed and thankful to have Pastor Brad and his family here, Lord. So we pray for him, continued um, grace for him and his family. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue the worship of your song. Let the 
We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. There the news to every land. Then the steeps and cross the waves. Onward to the Lord's command. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Find your seats again, and we'll continue in our worship through song.
Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia. Okay, we're going to go with that one. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated and the children may be excused. Well, it's lovely to see you all here this morning as uh, sickness seems to continue to uh, bring one and another into a, a, a situation where they can't come to church. We continue to pray for those who aren't able to be here specifically for um, Jess and Sophie and their families are, are, are struggling with this kind of nasty cold. But uh, that won't stop us from studying the Word this morning. In fact, they may well be watching, so don't say anything mean about them. You wouldn't do that anyway. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, how we praise and thank you for the incredible gift of your word, of your life, of your son. We praise you for your faithfulness to us through all of the trials, joys, and triumphs, failures of this life. Lord, we do praise you for the opportunity to gather together for the health and ability uh, and freedom to sing your praises, to open your word, to declare publicly your gospel. We thank you for all these great blessings and rich blessings that not every believer throughout all time has enjoyed in the degree that we do. So we pray you would be glorified in this morning's study and uh, service. We pray that our, our, our minds would be fixed, our eyes of faith would be fixed on your son, Jesus Christ that we would listen to your word, and so grant us, by the power of your spirit, uh, growth in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're moving on to, uh, to 2 Corinthians. We finished 1 Corinthians. 
It's huge, 16 huge chapters of theologically and culturally challenging things, things that maybe surprised us and uh, ways, things that we had to rethink and uh, striking uh, revelation from the Lord, and it's really good. And it, it got me thinking, actually, I was talking to Finn, we, we were talking about the interesting reality of sequels, that there's so few sequels that ever really live up to the original, right? I mean, you see that first one, and you know that somewhere some Hollywood executive is like, well, that was great. I bet I could squeeze more money out of that, like the soulless monster that I am. So we get a lot of sequels that we simply don't want. I mean, some like uh, Top Gun, Maverick, you know, couldn't live up, at least for my uh, standard, or Back to the Future 3. But then the really sad ones are the ones that you wish you could get and you never do, right? So there's certain movies that just really needed a sequel and never got one, and, uh, and that's something too. But uh, there are very few sequels that ever like got up to the, to the level of their original. And thankfully, I'm going to get this off before the internet comes for me. Um, <laughs> they, there are very few sequels that live up. But 2 Corinthians, if we can call it playfully a sequel, will absolutely live up to everything that, uh, that the Lord has to reveal for us. So... 2 Corinthians, interesting though, is an overlooked treasure. Now, uh, again, you may not spend as much time as I do, you know, combing through the, the theological journals and, and looking for new good Bible study resources and commentaries, but if you do such a search, you'll find that there's much more written about 1 Corinthians, much more uh, studied out, many more uh, journal articles, much more controversy than 2 Corinthians. In fact, it's often overlooked, it's less preached, it's less talked about, and that is an absolute tragedy, because just as all of the Word of God, it has valuable and important message for us, but it has no less important messages than those of the other books of the New Testament or the Bible. In fact, in the book of 2 Corinthians, we get Paul's most personal kind of language. Now, he wrote personally in all of his epistles, and some more than others. This is one of those incredibly passionate, personal, loving messages. And lest we start to think that Christians or the Christian life is best lived by a computer that can hold lots of data, we can now be transformed to realize that the Christian life is filled with love and emotional engagement and connection with the body of Christ and care for one another that isn't only limited to our intellectual uh, dedications, but also moves and flows out through every aspect of our life. Interestingly, in 1 Corinthians, we talk, saw a lot about church discipline and, and things and behaviors and sins that needed to be confronted in the church at Corinth. But in 2 Corinthians, we get information about how to restore those breaches, how to bring those back, showing that Paul's desire was never to kick people out or see people removed. Paul's desire is the Lord's desire to see when we're in sin, see us restored. When we're in error, see us restored to the body, restored to a biblical viewpoint, restored ultimately to our fellowship with Christ and one another. And boy, that can be tough to do. It's far easier to kick someone out than it is to continue to care for them, love them, and seek after their restoration, hoping that you can put those behind, those uh, differences behind, and move forward in the mission that the Lord has given us in the church. So 2 Corinthians is a powerful book, and perhaps why it's slightly ignored by the, the modern church is expressly because it gets into the far more difficult but far more important features of what the Christian life is meant to look like and how we love and care for one another. The next thing, the Corinthian church continued, it appears, to lack respect for Paul's ministry. And that's another part of this incredibly passionate epistle because Paul is going right to the heart to tell them and show them how much he loves them, how much he cares for them. Isn't it amazing how our mind, especially our sin nature, can play such tricks on us when someone's out of the room? right? We just become so incredibly uh, suspicious of other people when we haven't been around them for a while. And so in Paul's absence, while I believe that everything that he wrote and everything that he uh, exemplified to them was filled with tender mercy and loving care and high hope for them, when he got away, it was just easy enough for people to somehow cast doubt 
or disparage his character and his concern and his love, and they were willing to entertain, though he was the one who brought the gospel to them, though he was the one who cared for them and labored for them, though he was the one who went out of his way to raise funds so as not to burden them. They still continued to uh, question the legitimacy of his message. And so Paul here defends his mission, his mission, his apostleship, and his message because he loves the Corinthian believers. And I think uh, something that is familiar to all of us is it's painful to see someone you love get scammed. Some of us will have been subject to a scam or another, right, where someone calls you and gives you some kind of information like, oh, your, your granddaughter, or even going so far as to pretend to be the grandchild and, and then try to get you to uh, go to Western Union or get a check or get iTunes gift cards, right? There's a scam going every minute. And uh, just on the, if you want to spend some time this afternoon with some good uplifting content. There's a great YouTuber named Mark Rober who goes around and like finds things. I think he started off with the porch pirates. People would steal, you know, Amazon packages and he'd put these bombs in them. Not explosive bombs, but the, the, the thief would open it up and their room would be covered with glitter and fart spray. I don't know how much it did to stop porch piracy, but at least it provided the satisfaction of video footage of people who wanted to steal from others, getting covered in glitter and having to figure out what that was. Well, that uh, effort of Mark Rober continued on into going after scam call centers, these usually foreign call centers in which they will call and, and, and use some sort of uh, tricky, you know, slick words to to manipulate someone's emotions and ultimately empty their bank account or, or steal massive amounts of money from them, their whole savings in many cases. Uh, and this happens and just kind of as a public service announcement, never give anyone over the phone access to your uh, information, never give them anything having to do with your bank account or anything like that, never go to the computer when they ask you to go to the computer. That will never be your bank. That will never be the government. They're lying to you. Just hang up on them, okay? Get, promise? All right, good. If you're in, I'm in. If you have a question, give me a call. I'll hang up on them, okay? That's fine, but here is, uh, here is this reality. So it, it, it gives an incredible amount of satisfaction as this uh, same YouTuber went even to the point of shutting down five of these uh, foreign call centers by glitter and stink bombing them out of existence uh, and, and uh, resolving that. So if you want some fun, uh, there's a whole series of some videos. But I think that that same feeling of triumph that sees someone, someone's retirement or life savings return to them or some thief finally caught and, and, and um, you know, excoriated for their misdeeds that what brings us that satisfaction is, is exactly what motivated Paul to fight so passionately for the hearts of the Corinthian church. You see, because it's, it, it's horrifying, it's awful to think that someone is scammed out of some or even all of their money, but far greater or maybe far more terrible is when people are scammed out of their spiritual heritage, their spiritual life, the joy, the, the, the life, the, the exuberant existence that God has given us in His Son, Jesus Christ, because they listen to a scammer just like this, because they let some, sadly, maybe even self-deceived person with best intentions come in and rob them of the riches of all that God has done for them in Jesus Christ. Not that they could rob them of their salvation by any stretch of the imagination, but by introducing false doctrine and lies, you are absolutely not going to enjoy the perfect uh, the growth that you're meant to experience in your walk with Christ. It's big. It's not a, meh, not that big a deal. It's a very big deal. It's a very big deal to Paul, so much so that he's writing all these letters to correct bad ideas that were coming from their culture, from false teachers, from false prophets. They, were, they wrote these so that we would have the Word of God and be protected from the lies, the deceptions of the world, both in and without of the church. And Paul here is fighting with that level of ferocity and passion because he knows that if we are not growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ in complete reliance on the perfected work of Jesus Christ at the cross, in reliance on the Holy Spirit as he's provided for us, we won't complete our mission. 
and that's not acceptable. That's not okay from God's perspective, from Paul's perspective, or ours. So here I see a couple examples of Paul's loving and passionate heart. Here in 2 Corinthians 2, 4, he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Um, there's a, a great phrase in writing, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. And Paul wrote, and we can feel the emotion, the passion, that it wasn't just a dispassionate, cold, look, this is the truth. I don't care whether you take it or leave it. It was the loving, parental-type care and concern that if they did not understand who Jesus Christ was, what he's done for us, what he has for us, what he's provided for us, then they would fail to enjoy that salvation which had been so graciously given to them by God. And so, as he heard the bad news about Corinth, it broke his heart. It caused him uh, sadness or sorrow in the utmost degree. And I can tell you, that that is the way of all true pastoral ministry or all true ministry. It's motivated by a love and a care. And I can't tell you the number of sleepless nights that I've spent because someone comes up with or has been infected or taken away or carried away by some horrifying non-biblical heresy that will result in the destruction of their soul. But for whatever reason, they become unresponsive. There's nothing to do but weep for the sorrow that's ahead for that person. He moves uh, also in 2 Corinthians 6.11. He says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. It is important to us in a modern Western perspective. We would very frequently probably rather have been given a textbook, so much so that we will very frequently rewrite the uh, teaching of the Word of God into a textbook of some kind, a systematic theology, some sort of theological treatise that is as cold un or, un uh, or unemotional as possible. We just want to get down to those oh-so-precious facts, but God never seemed to communicate with us in that way. I'm not saying that it's bad to read. I have a whole library of beautiful theological writings that are trying to separate uh, the facts from the emotions or the feelings. But interestingly, when God wanted to communicate himself to us, he started with stories of his interactions with us. And so you get in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, all of the most interesting stuff, the creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, these huge, amazing, miraculous events that we'd love to know more and more and have unending questions about but they get 11 chapters. But the balance of the 50 chapters of Genesis are about what? God's interaction with Abraham, God's interaction with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. God reveals himself to us personally and reveals himself to us in his word through describing that. And so the Bible is not just a list of things to believe or commandments to keep. It is rather a rolling revelation of God and his character and his relationship with the nation of Israel, with David personally, with the prophets, and through them, these uh, weeping, crying, screaming messages to try to call his beloved uh, earthly people, Israel, back to himself. And when he really wanted us to know him, the chief revelation of God to us is when he put on skin and came down and joined us and walked amongst us, felt the sand of the earth that he'd created beneath his very feet, depended upon the air and food that he had began and created all those years prior. Because the way for us to know God is to know his son, Jesus Christ. And then when that, as that story continues and we get to these letters and we find out what the church needs to know, he doesn't give us an organized list of everything that's important, but rather he writes using his apostles, Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude, to write letters to people, doctrine in context of lives, of church families, of relationships. You can become the best Bible egghead in the world and look nothing like Jesus in your life. It's a real threat. It's a real possibility. 
And it's really way more attractive to us. It's way easier, way more fun to be the Bible know-it-all than it is to be the one who lives truly like Christ. And what Paul shows here is that mixed in with the revelation of the truth and the doctrine of God was an honest, emotional, available communication that was not just trimmed or edged with love, not just a warm greeting and a nice goodbye, but every single chapter immersed, doused in the positive, loving, caring, self-sacrificing heart of Paul as he was showing the loving, caring, self-sacrificing heart of Christ. And every word drips not just with the truth of God, but also with the concomitant emotion and care and love that is meant to exemplify every Christian life. And so in 1 Corinthians, we see Paul writing not as a doctrine machine, but as an emotionally invested person in those whom he loved. For those who might be joining, I see a few new faces, joining our study uh, here, or maybe have joined after we began 1 Corinthians, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Corinth. So here is Corinth. In, I, I didn't choose this. This is not my map. I would not have chosen red because I'm sure you can't see that. But I will take a laser pointer that is also red. Man, winning. I'm so good at this. Um, here's Corinth, right? This Greek city, and it's in the region, as we uh, saw in our reading, it's in the region of Achaia or Achaia, but depending on you know, where you want to put the emphasis. Uh, and you see that this is a Greek city, and it was a Greek city of incredible uh, wealth and import. We can see based upon its placement that it had uh, ability both to move kind of off of a rather narrow land bridge and move goods or things, things like that in. So it was a very wealthy city in terms of economy or, or commerce and trade. We can see that the uh, Roman fountain to the, in ancient Corinth was once a beautiful, breathtaking um, a place that would draw tourism and, and all other things, as well as here the uh, Temple of Apollo. These uh, ruins, if you can imagine what they would have looked like, show that this was an area absolutely cosmopolitan in every way, filled with all the immorality that comes with a sort of man-of-the-world attitude, wherein money and excess are readily available. And so, being in that culture and coming only a few years out of it by trusting in Christ, we find that the Corinthian church struggled with all the things that faced or challenged the culture in Corinth. And it's an important point to note that hopefully we don't sit around with bitter hearts and minds and constantly whining about the ungodly culture. That is what the ungodly culture is going to do. That's what uh, has happened when, again, until the Lord returns is going to be the case. But we need to be mindful as to the sinful desires and kind of direction or slant of, the, of our culture because that is what's going to infect the church most fully and most insidiously. Because everyone else is doing it. Everyone else says it's okay. Everyone else thinks it's fine. So therefore, we probably should too. It's so easy to go with the tide. And we've seen this in many churches or so-called churches throughout that as the world decides that it is somehow intolerant to ag agree with biblical sexual ethics, that many churches will cave and say, well, it's, it's how the world sees it now. It was a different time. It's a different age. So let's, let's abandon things like marriage. Let's abandon things like heterosexuality and the like, right? We shouldn't be surprised at this at all. Remember, the world is the world, and the flesh is the flesh. And every single person who does not know Christ has no other choice but to, be go, to go along with the world, the flesh, and the devil. They have no ability to overpower, to resist. They are a part of a system that is drawing them closer and closer. It's kind of funny, as, as we see very frequently, no matter who's in charge, the other side takes this huge self-righteous, I'm the resistance, we're fighting back, blah, blah, blah. And it's ridiculous. Because both sides are just as worldly as the other. Now, you might uh, find that one side represents biblical ethics more than the other in your understanding, and praise God, vote, do all that stuff. It probably won't matter, but it will make you feel better about being here. Nevertheless, we'll point out that if you're not standing with Christ, 
then you're just standing with the world. If you're allowing this side or that side or putting these people in control or that people in control or this cultural thing or that music into your mindset, then you're missing the ultimate point, which is to be on the Lord's side, which isn't going to stand with anyone else in the world all the time. And so it's very important that we recognize that whatever's going on in our culture, it's very easy for us to get sucked in and start participating whether that's, again, uh, dulling our perspective on what the Lord has revealed as morally to be the true or what is sin, right, and abhorring sin, or whether that is culturally the goals and desires and affectations and expectations of the world versus what the Lord's expectations and desires are for this time. The Lord's desire in this time is for your sanctification, your spiritual growth, so that you can be His representative of His gospel and His truth in this world. Don't waste that time. Don't get infected by what the world values, what the world says is important. Don't take on worldly causes. Take on Christ's cause. Take on the cause of representing, of praying for the unsaved in your world and your life. Take on the cause, if anything, of making sure that the gospel is published and known. Take on the cause of praying for and caring for and loving with the love of Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ, so that they might be edified in the church. Take on those causes. Invest your time there. That's, those are God's causes. So, just like we have this challenge, so Corinth had this challenge, and their church, as we saw in 1 Corinthians, was plagued with factionalism. They wanted to follow this guy or that guy. It wasn't about Christ and his word. It was about making sure that you chose the best leader or hero to attach your name. And we've said it before and we say it again. Well, non-denominationalism or being a non-denominational church has ultimately kind of settled into becoming a denomination to itself, tragically. The reality is, is that no single person or movement is worthy of placing their name on your faith or your wearing on your t-shirt. Not Martin Luther, not John Calvin, not this guy, not that guy. No one is worthy to, 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 to place their label on your life other than Christ and the truth of his word. All that other factionalism uh, was destroying the church at Corinth because I follow Paul and I follow Apollos, and Paul calls this the height of spiritual maturity, immaturity or babyhood. Getting all roused up and rattled about who we're going to follow, who we're going to attach ourselves to, whose name, Chafer, or whatever else that we want to put on our faith. Also, immaturity of all kinds, spiritual immaturity plagued this church. They were immature not because they were spiritually young, but they were immature because they were attra attached to uh, all kinds of immorality. When it came to sin issues, they were happy to prefer what God had forbidden over what God had uh, provided, over God had, what God had uh, de demanded of them or asked of them. And so that immaturity, that compromise with the world and a lackadaisical attitude towards sin kept them in a perpetual spiritual babyhood. And most of all, just bad doctrine, bad doctrine about marriage, bad doctrine about giving, bad doctrine, most importantly, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul spent that 15th chapter just affirming the absolute necessity and reality of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ as the central doctrine of Christianity, a non-negotiable in any sense and in every place. And as we'll see, this, uh, this letter is written probably a year or less out. So not much changed or could be expected to change so quickly, especially in that you know, ancient time of, of the movement of information, the speed of it. So some of the issues in 1 Corinthians are going to be clarified and made more, hopefully, more clear to us as well. Some new topics are introduced and discussed, and we have an exciting study ahead. I wanted to just look very briefly at this outline. It should be printed on your handout, and I would encourage you, if you are, are brave and bold and you have scissors, go ahead and cut that out. Stick it in your Bible. Uh, stick it right in front of First Corinthians or Second Corinthians. Don't put it in front of First Corinthians. That'd be ridiculous. 
put it in front of Second Corinthians, and take that and um, so that you can keep yourself in uh, in context to what's going on. Most bad Bible interpretation comes because people rip things out of their context. All of the Bible was delivered by men who were in possession of their senses, able to write clearly what God had for them to understand. And we uh, highlighted this in our Wednesday night service as to why Jesus taught when he could just zap. He could have, right? He's, he's the sovereign over all. He could have just, You're, you believe, and you believe, and you believe, and you believe, and your mind has changed, and your mind has changed, and they'd never know why. they just go around because he could do that. He's God. And yet he didn't choose to do that. He chose to teach. He chose to confront them with reasoning. He chose to uh, present them with new evidence about himself, about God himself, about the Word of God. God wants to work with that ball of fat that sits in your skull to make you change voluntarily the way that you think and interact with him for the goal that you would be freely conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. You're a part and party to that. And so what happens, what, how he did that, how he chose to do that, and we must assume it's the very best way, is to provide us with these books, these letters, these epistles, these uh, accounts, that we have, these poems that we have in the Word of God, to change your thinking to match His thinking. It is very much the message of Romans 12, 1 and 2, which I'll turn to to make sure I get exactly right. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hear that, be transformed. That is metamorpho, it is changing one thing into another. Have your mind be changed from that world-soaked rag that it was into a Bible-soaked edifice, building of God's glory and revelation. Learn to see things the way God sees things and the way God wants you to see things. How are you going to do that? By understanding the logical, reasonable argument that he made through his word. That's the way God wanted to change you, in part, and see you grow, is by making rational, reasonable arguments that by the power of the Spirit of God, you might apply to see transformation in your life. And so he starts off with this greeting that we're briefly ex examining and thinking about today. Uh, he talks about comfort in suffering, which is going to play a dual role because obviously every Christian deals with suffering to one degree or another and wonders what the value or import of that is. But also we find that Paul is, is, is going to move forward into the suffering which he experienced and is experiencing because of their rejection and doubting of him and his ministry. So he moves on then in verse one, or chapter 1, verse 12, all the way through 7, 16, into the section of defending his ministry, explaining to them how and why and what it means that he was chosen by God to give this special set of messages and have this special office or a place of apostleship in the church. It is very important because, one, it talks about the uh, yes, all promises are yes in Christ. Ultimately, that Paul was trying to show them that their Hope was not in him, Paul the Apostle, but in Christ himself. Finally, or moving on, defining apostleship. Boy, this is a very important passage, so important, and it goes on to sort of a reprise of that in verse chapter 11, verses 1 through 15, because we need to understand what an apostle is. A lot of jokers running around claim to be apostles today. They don't meet the standard. They don't meet the standard put clearly and fully in the Word of God as to what we're to expect of apostles. And so we praise God because while this was a personal problem that Paul was having with the Corinthian church, it is now preserved for all of us to now have a biblical standard of what to expect in that office and why Paul was an apostle so-and-so from just down the street today is not. 
Next, he moves on to the good news. He moves on to the, uh, the good news of, of, of what uh, is meant to go forward. And then we have one of the best, in fact, the, the, the chief treaties in the New Testament on giving, financial giving, going from 8 to 9.15. You see, in the Old Testament, under the law, giving was controlled by um, the law, by the command, uh, the percentage, and sometimes called the tithe. And uh, because people who talk about the tithe very rarely actually read the Bible, they're going to think you should give 10%. But the, Bible, the Old Testament required far more than 10% to the Lord. It was well into 20. And so uh, we're going to see that Paul, in, the, in this New Testament era, there's no tithe for us to, to give. In fact, we are to regard everything that we own as being the Lord's, and we are to give generously and with thought based upon the leading of the Lord. And so we see that even financial giving, which was controlled in one sense in the Old Testament and, and dictated in one sense in the Old Testament, has now got a whole new face to it as we learn to view everything in our lives as a subject or an object for generosity, for the care of our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the edification of the church. We've got a whole new version of giving, and we can't say, sorry, gave at the office, did my, did my share, tithe my time to God but rather have a new relationship with God and this new life under grace has a very different perspective on our possessions. Next, we'll look at false apostles, again, getting kind of the other side of the coin, noting that just as today, that there were those who were pretending to be of Christ, but opposed Christ in their word, their teaching, their doctrine, and their false gospel. And so he gives us even more impetus to understand that he himself was commissioned by God and lived up to that standard along with Peter and James and the others who wrote. Why is this so important? Because we need to understand how and why God qualified men to be the, the, the instrument to deliver His Word. You can trust the Word of God because you can trust what, how the Lord expressed and used these people in this time for that purpose. It gives you more confidence than ever that these weren't just a bunch of old documents that someone happened to throw together at the last minute and say, Bible! But rather, they knew that they were useful to God. The external miracles and signs confirmed that. And all of the false teachers, false prophets, and false apostles only brought into sharper relief the genuine nature of those whom God chose to give us His wonderful Word, this beautiful, closed, perfect, complete canon. You don't need another word from the Lord for the rest of your life. You have the Word of the Lord that is, sa that is useful and complete and absolutely sufficient for every need of the rest of our lives until we see Him face to face. And he talks about a visit, and that becomes theologically important because he's trying to under, help them understand his love for them and how that might be tough love at certain times. And then we have the final greeting in 13, 11 through 14. So hopefully you're excited. But as we already we started off saying that this is a sequel, well, how else do you find out about movies, right? You, you go through the previews. And right, if you're watching a Comedy, usually only all the funniest parts are in the previews, and you're like, oh, did, I just, did I just spend an hour and a half to watch something that the best parts could be condensed to 35 seconds? And the answer is usually yes. But uh, thankfully, in the Word of God, that's not the case. So I, I wanted to give you a much less than 35-second set of previews. You see, one of the things that we do when we study the Word of God here is we study it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's interesting. There's a wonderful Bible teacher named Charles Ryrie, and you, some of you may have his study Bible in your lap right now. And in early on in his life, he wrote a book about putting the cookies on the lowest shelf. In other words, making the Word of God as accessible and available and understandable as possible, and therefore, uh, you know, that the purpose of teaching was to do that. And then later in his life, he wrote a book, uh, an essay called Putting the Cookies Back on the Shelf. And essentially what this was about, as a, as a funny, you know, play on his previous essay, what this was about is not just rushing to our favorite, most popular headline verses. And many ministries, if they teach the Bible at all, will just go from one favorite verse or passage to another favorite verse or passage and overlook all those difficult or challenging passages, those parts that might be uh, a little bit, you know, boring from our perspective, right? 
How many of us are ready to get up and really excited for that next, you know, sermon on genealogies of the Old Testament, right? We've got limits. And yet, there is a need for the full counsel of God. There is a need to be taught every word of it. We don't need to just jump to the high points or the highlights. You need every word that comes from the mouth of God. And sometimes you might say, oh my goodness, are we going to spend an hour on this? Yeah, we sure are. And so this is what he meant by putting the cookies back on the shelf, is making sure that so that when you come to these wonderful, blessed verses, and they are wonderful verses, there are highlights, hopefully in your Bible, right, of your favorite verses, the ones that you connect with, the ones that you've memorized and, and, and really, uh, you know, rely upon with some regularity. But understanding the context of those verses is going to bring more meaning and a fuller application of them than you have uh, based on just ripping them out of context. So that's why we do this the way we do. That's why we continue to, to seek that. Nevertheless, I'm going to give you some of my favorites so you can anticipate them and what you have to look forward to. Here's uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 says, which is next week's message, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in tr any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We all need a better understanding of the comfort of God, and this, ver this uh, study will give us a chance to look at that with some uh, depth. Verses, chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 say, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one, of your, one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We could have chosen this for many reasons, but I, was most important, uh, I thought it most important to point out that in this book we're going to get to look at and study the reality of the spiritual battle and conflict that goes on and rages on around us. And while Paul is quite bold to say that we are not ignorant, I would argue that most Christians today are ignorant of Satan's devices. Uh, so hopefully we'll clear that up. But if the ministry of death written engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 8. This is such an important uh, verse because it shows us that this new economy of the body of Christ, of life in the church, has a different relationship to God in regards to the law. And we're not going back to the law of Moses. We're not governed by the law of Moses. We're edified by the law of Moses. But it is not um, a Ten Commandments obedience game to grow in Christ. Rather, the Holy Spirit, as we're studying in our, our morning class, has an all-new place, a starring role in your growth. And it's not just the uh, legalism offered by the past. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible that I've, I'm excited to teach, we've touched on many, many times over the years, but to look at it in its context is a real blessing. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we look into the Word of God, the Spirit of God transforms us from glory to glory into His image. That's exciting. Oops. Here's uh, 4, 7 through 10, very familiar to many of us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And that life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. No image from Scripture, I think, so adequately describes the Christian's experience of living on in these bodies and bumping up against all the other clay pots, and yet knowing that what is true and real and eternal by your faith in Jesus Christ exists within you. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, another great uh, one that gets incorporated in lots of songs and, and cards. We walk by faith and not by sight. I'm so excited to talk about that one because it's, again, one of those verses that gets quoted so frequently it gets almost emptied of its meaning. But 
Do you live your life by your sight, by your senses, by your feelings, or do you live your life by the revealed Word of God? We have absolutely deified our feelings in this culture and in this time. We deify our perceptions and our thoughts, and so many of us think that our thoughts are so great, God probably agrees with us. But you have a choice to walk by faith in what He's revealed and who He's revealed in His Son rather than walking by our own senses, thoughts. And it's just, it's just great news because it means you don't have to trust your dumb brain anymore. Your brain is it's, it's, it's fine. It's God-created, but it's been touched by sin and the Word of God. It's so much better when you live according to that. 510, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Our lives will come to a wonderful evaluation at the Bema Seat of Christ if you're a believer today, and that is meant to provide us with motivation and context and an understanding whereby we might truly reach that, uh, that goal of bringing glory to Christ in our lives. Knowing that it is there and understanding what that means is a critical part of success in the Christian life. And so we will get the opportunity, if the Lord tarries, to talk about that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're going to learn this about this incredible new position which you've been given in Jesus Christ, that you have been made a new creature that you are now a part of the new heavens and the new earth. You are a living, walking preview of all that is to come and all the promises of God that will be fulfilled. This is a positional truth, not a not a uh, in-practice truth. You are that whether you live up to the standard of what you've cre- be created to be or not. But you have been put in a place to be a new creature in Christ, and all those things that you were are now, from God's perspective, perfectly passed away. 710, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. There's a great thing that happens when the word of God is taught is that people's feelings get hurt. They get mad, they get offended, and that's a great thing. And the Holy Spirit continues to push on them and push on them because godly sorrow leads to repentance. Of course, there's also worldly sorrow that leads us to harden our hearts and strengthen our position and our false teaching. But praise God. The Holy Spirit never lets up. Verse uh, two, uh, 9, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, who, who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudging or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. A new standard of giving and sharing in the church. 10, 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. We will get to look at the real nature of the spiritual conflict that rages around us. And it's not unseen ghosts that hide behind and goblins that hide behind bushes. It is the high-minded deceptions of the world that present themselves through the modern academy, through your books, through your uh, literature, through television, and they move and oppose themselves against the truth of the knowledge of the Word of God. That is how the enemy is primarily working in this world. And so now we can learn how to positively be a part of the correction of that or take our place in the spiritual struggle. 11, 13 through 14, for such as are such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. This is such an important verse for us to understand because when Satan comes to try to deceive the church, he doesn't always show up in that weird demonic Kevin Copeland suit or Kenneth Copeland suit. It's bizarre, but that one's just too obvious. Like he's obviously grabbing for the low hanging fruit in the church to deceive people with that guy. Nevertheless, as often as not, it'll be in the most handsome, beautiful, uh, attractive passage, the most eloquent teaching, the most unbelievably effective emotional plea or even intellectual argument. 
The reality is, is that we can't go around looking for that person in red tights and hooves and horns. We'll ultimately find that Satan's deception will always be premierly attractive. 12, 9 through 10. And he said, my grace, he said to me, my grace, Paul speaking of his uh, thorn in his flesh, his difficulty, his physical difficulty. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproaches in needs in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is an upside down from the world's way of looking at stuff, of measuring success. But boy, we still try to measure success the other way, don't we? This incredible humility that Paul celebrated. He who had the most to boast about, arguably. Miracles done with his own hands. The word of God delivered through his own pen. And yet it is in his weakness, in his humility, that he boasted. Because it must have been a great God indeed who could use such a wreck as us. So our great journey continues. And I hope you're excited. Our journey through First and Second Corinthians continues on with these folks. Again, just a year apart, this, uh, this new information and revelation will teach us and show us how to live, how to act as the body of Christ, how to be and represent His life and His love in this world, how to bring Him glory. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise You again for Your Word. We thank You again for Your incredible provision for us. Please, O oh Lord, be glorified in our study. Might we look honestly and with courage at your word. Might we accept with humility the correction it provides for us. Might we be truly transformed from glory to glory as we gaze into the mirror of your word to behold your beautiful, wonderful, perfect son and bring him glory and praise in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to rise and we'll continue our song, uh, worship through song.
we'll be assembling again on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. We're going through a series on the life of Christ, and we'll be considering the miracles that Jesus did this Wednesday. Um, annual meeting is today, so um, if you're planning on sticking around, just continue to be seated after I, I pray. Brad will come up, and, and we'll get that kicked off immediately and seek to be respectful of, of your time. Um, if you don't wish to participate for whatever reason, you're welcome to, to be dismissed after, as Brad will, will say again. Um, Mystery Island VBS, June, late June. There's a sign-up for that if you wish to participate um, and, and volunteer in whatever way that, that might look to you. This upcoming Saturday, Holly's Baby Shower, there's a sign-up in, in the back for that. If you want to be involved, and as Sam put on Wednesday, if you're qualified. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for the gift of your word to us, God, the, the fact that uh, we have something tangible that, that we can look to and, and know and be confident that it's from you. It's, it's your revelation to us of what we couldn't know if you hadn't revealed it in, in this way. And so we ask that as we go through Second Corinthians, you would just impress upon us um, Paul's heart for the, the Corinthians and, and your heart for, for us and, and uh, just grow us, God. Help us to understand your word and apply it here as a, as a local assembly and, and in our individual uh, lives. God, and may you be glorified through uh, this assembly of believers throughout this continued study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as Ben so well put, we uh, uh, will invite anybody who'd like to, to, to whether you don't want to take part because of... Uh, of non-membership status at this point, but we will use this opportunity to remind you that there is no uh, written church membership in the Bible. Your membership in the church is when you trusted in Jesus Christ, were united with him and his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating. You became a part of the universal body of Christ, and that is the important point. You get to take part in, take part in local assemblies, and we have a state requirement that causes us to uh, vote on certain issues. We embrace that because it gives us a chance to be transparent, to make sure that we're hearing everybody's voice, but we'll say it again because it's important, and that is that if you have input on the church, on the direction of the church, please just share it. Like, by all means, we hope to be available to you. We've got deacons and elders who are hopefully ready to hear whatever um, re recommendations or thoughts you have. Um, yeah, that's not the that's not the point of this. Um, so while you're voting, I just want to take some time to talk about some of the accomplishments of last year. If you have any questions, um, Ben, just raise your hand and Ben will answer them for you. Uh, but 2023 was a really good year. In our online teaching ministry, we garnered 15.1 thousand views, which is up 34% from last year, 3.2 thousand hours of watching, which is up 121%, and 169 new subscribers up from uh, up 111% from last year's gain. So the Lord seems to be drawing attention to all the great uh, teaching and, and people I know because I get uh, emails from all over the world are blessed to be able to participate in our Sunday morning time and are blessed to be able to, uh, um, yeah, uh, to hear from our, our wonderful teachers and, and great things that are going on. The bathrooms were miraculously upgraded, and thank you so much to, uh, to uh, Kenny and Marla for all the hard work and for uh, all that came with that. It's a big move forward. Uh, it had a, I mean, because our bathrooms used to look like a place where, like, children's nightmares happened. Right? Like, just had that sort of five nights at Freddy's feel to them. And now they're so beautiful and welcoming. Uh, we had a monumentally successful year at Camp Arete, bringing, I think, six uh, students of our own to a great year where we taught through Ephesians. We merged our Bible college with Colorado Biblical University and expanded our scope of ministry for all of our, our teachers and hopefully the opportunities for our students there. We taught, uh, I taught, a, got to teach a Bible uh, seminar, a Bible conference, a Cornerstone Bible conference in um, 
uh, South Dakota. We enjoyed fellowship at game nights and cook, chili cook-offs and all sorts of fun things like that. We hosted two Bible conferences in the fall. We hosted, or rather in the spring, we hosted Genesis in the fall. We had the Epistles of John that was of great joy and pleasure for us all. Jordan and Anna got married, which was awesome. We're really glad they did that. Wonderful. And a great fellowship of our monthly men's breakfast uh, uh, has been uh, just an outstanding a string of successful fellowship between men, and also at our women's uh, Bible study, went through, uh, is going through Luke, and what'd you go through in the fall? Was it Proverbs, Proverbs in the fall, which resulted in the publication in the back of, uh, of on the Proverbs, so if you want to read that, you can. Wednesday evening services, we went through Philippians and Galatians. We taught online sessions with Young Life Philippines Dog Tag Training Program. We got to teach at Tacoma Grace Bible Conference on soteriology, along with uh, Dane Rogers and Morgan Arnold. We got to contribute several times to the Not By Works podcast with J.B. Hickson. In fact, we just uh, uh, co contributed a new um, episode that came out on Friday on worldliness in the life of the believer. We continued to support Chafer Theological Seminary on the board. We're starting the Chafer Journal and teaching spiritual life class there. We sent Brad to Brazil to teach a pastor's conference on Romans, and I got to go to Duluth as well and teach there at the Duluth Bible Church Pastors Conference. We continue to support Grace Global Radio with teaching and roundtable discussions and th on theological issues as well as financial issues. The biblical training program is continuing to bless people in the body of Christ, both locally and around the world. We have uh, new uh, members or students from uh, all over the United States and continue to serve uh, folks in Canada and, uh, and elsewhere. So uh, finally, we began True Grace Books out of our, our in-house publishing ministry, finally needed to grow up and mature and reach its adolescence and adulthood in uh, the ministry of True Grace Books. So now we're publishing all various Bible study books on Proverbs, Truth and Grace, uh, and Caroling to Christmas, which sold thousands of copies around the world. It was shocking for us, just shocking. We've never seen that kind of a reveal. So um, all that I hope we take from this is that the Lord is using, are we, did, oh, yeah, Pastor Ballotson, go ahead and collect those. <laughs> and we'll, we'll go get those counted. Ben's got gotcha. you, Brian's got gotcha. you, Kenny's got gotcha. you. Um, but we don't uh, we don't bring all this up to 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 boast and brag, save in what the Lord Jesus Christ can do and uh, can do with a faithful few. Here we are, no great mega church, right? We're not stopping up traffic outside of the church on Sunday mornings. But the Lord is using this body. The Lord's using your fellowship. The Lord's using your faithfulness and being here and being involved and invested and praying for your church family and praying for your church leadership. The Lord is using us, and that's a good sign. That's something that we can be encouraged by, not, again, in our own ability or, or um, great strategy, but because of the great love and power with which he loves, him, loves us. And it's my hope that is was once said of D.L. Moody uh, when someone said, had heard a very famous at the time speaker and then heard D.L. Moody said, well, so-and-so gives a great speech, but D.L. Moody has a great Jesus, a great God. And I hope that's what, what you experience here at Fort Collins Bible Church, and I hope that's what's said uh, in the short and long term about our ministry here. I hope that ultimately it can be said that, boy, they must have a great God to make such good use out of their lives. Let's uh, close our time in prayer. If you choose to hang around and wait for the results of the vote, um, so far we've not really ever had one that wasn't very nearly or entirely unan unanimous. So if you're the one, go ahead and stand up now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this, this church family, Lord, this small, humble group of believers who know but ultimately, it's not about us at all. Not our greatness, not our uh, brilliance, not our abilities, but about you. We long to be responsive to what you would have us do as you've revealed through your word, to prioritize what you have made a priority, to respond to your plan and act accordingly so that we might do that good and perfect will in our time on this planet, Lord. 
We praise you and we thank you for the, your love, for your life, and most of all, for the saving work of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Might it be the message on our lips, might it be the mission of our souls to see more and know all that you've done for them in Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Lucas was close. <laughs> We'll recognize our new deacons in the weeks to come. Have a great week, guys.